Hello everybody, welcome back to yet another episode of Ruby Rambling Reaction Review. Today, we will be looking at Volume 4, Episode 3 of Runaways and Stowaways. Scene 1, The Open Seas. Our first scene reunites us with everybody's favorite stray, Blake. She is traveling by boat alone, and boy is she nervous, like a long-tailed cat in a room of rocking chairs. She's getting spooked by kids and jumpy over the friendly captain, who doesn't have a name just yet, so I'm going to call him Captain Highliner. Story-wise, the captain approaches her, explaining that... Traveling by ship is the long and boring way over flying. So, while he says he struck up a conversation with Blake because those traveling alone have the best stories, I think it's more because he knows a nervous wreck when he sees one. And sometimes a quick conversation is enough of a distraction to calm a person like that down. Now, I really enjoyed their conversation, especially at the end after the kids spook Blake. The captain's laugh to Blake's pouty face after being called out for her paranoia. It's these sort of little interactions that really help the characters feel more alive. Now, back to Blake. She is sporting her new outfit, still very pirate-like in my books, but she does rock those thigh-high boots. For her, out of everything though, more than ever, I really, really now notice that her eyes pop out more than ever. Not just the color, but their expressions. So much more emotion just from the eyes glancing down while depressed or shifting side to side when scared by the children. All nice little touches, again making everything feel more alive. Lastly, seeing Blake without her bow at the end is probably the biggest change overall for me. It's not that I don't like the cat ears, don't get me wrong, it's just that the bow has been such an iconic look of hers. It's been an iconic part of her character. And it was almost not really surprising, but it was kind of weird just seeing her throwing away just so nonchalantly. It was an important moment for her character. But in the end, the scene just only had me whelmed. On one last note before moving on, the scene's backdrop itself is rather well done. The background characters look to be fully rendered with no janky looped animations. Uh, the ocean looks beautiful as well, almost like the water in the Wind Waker HD. Not to mention the camera slightly bobbing up and down with the waves of the ocean. It's a nice added touch just to kind of make you feel like you are actually on the ship getting seasick with the rest of them. Scene two, the Zhao Long house. Yang! Yes, we finally get our first scene with Yang, relaxing on the couch at home with his Y and his bed next to her. But before we talk about Yang, a quick bit of commentary on their home. The Zhao Long home is basically the home that I would like to live in. Screw the Sni estate, even if it's built from like pure marble. That place is too much like The Shining. I keep going back to that, but it creeps me out. But the Zhao Long's home seems so peaceful and relaxing. Everything's built from wood. Even here, for a few seconds, there's no music. But if you listen in the background, you hear nature as the background noise. The winds blowing, birds are chirping. Uh, it's just so good in comparison to the Snee estate. Moving on. Yang is not doing that well in comparison to Blake. She's bored, depressed, definitely not whelmed. Before she starts channel surfing, she glances over at some books next to her. Again, with that eye movement that I sort of mentioned with Blake before, uh, it really shows mostly disinterest. My theory is she's probably read those books already or is just tired of reading in general. And you can tell by the wide shots right before that there are a lot of books in this place. And there's a possibility that she might have read them all already and that's saying if she hasn't left the house in the last eight months going back to the eyes again they also show her disinterest even with the news as she's watching television if you could call it television but as she's watching her eyes are only half open speaking of the news that shot of Glinda from the first news station is recycled video from the end of volume two come on VOC or VDC, that's hard to read. You need to get some cameras out there and shoot some new updated viz. Eight 
month old viz for a humanitarian disaster like Veil? That's just bad journalism. Another news station is saying Atlas is trying to help Veil rebuild the communications tower, but they are not hopeful it can be fixed. With the main tower gone, they are actually still able to use wireless communications, as you can tell by the television being able to work, but it's only within the, the kingdom itself. It's contained in the kingdom. They still cannot access the outside world by wireless means. The city of Vale is also still being evacuated. I guess over eight months, even the outskirts of the city are still unsafe. Also, it looks like the majority of the blame, within Vale at least, is being placed on Adam Taurus and not on Atlas. But as Ironwood said last episode, the other kingdoms still might think it was Atlas invading. The mention of Adam causes Yang to turn off the television completely. Not a major response, but a response from her nonetheless. A couple of little production tip mitts. It looks like Lisa Lavender is no longer just a two-dimensional character. Well, not personality-wise. I mean, she's actually 3D rendered now. Also, this part has been driving me crazy. I took like an hour break writing this to try and figure this part back. In this scene, here in the bottom text crawl, this pops up. Authorities baffled by mysterious code. 2FRVW capital Y capital F. What the hell is this code? I tried looking for it for an hour, entering into random places like the Rooster Teeth store, on Steam, on like any place I could think of, searching Google, bang. Eventually, I found uh, one person on Twitter and a couple of people on Reddit. There's maybe 10 or 20 people overall that are actually like actively searching for what this code means. Um, and one person, well, several people, I don't know who exactly discovered this first, discovered a bit.ly uh, shortcut link that redirects to a blank page that has rooster teeth in the URL. So maybe something will appear there soon. At this moment, Tai Yang returns home from a shopping trip. He is as positive as he usually is, as Yang sort of lazily says hello. His trip was for him to go out and get a new robotic prosthetic arm made for Yang. What he didn't know before leaving was that Ironwood already had one being made for Yang after the dust of the Battle of Beacon had settled. Now, really, Ironwood is the man. If you really think about it, Last episode, he keeps his cool, not snapping a jock when any lesser man would have been yelling back. I would have punched the little bugger. Not only that, but in the same instance, offering Weiss a spot at his academy as he leaves. And now you have this. He has gone out of his way and made Yang a custom arm before anyone even asked him to. I think, especially for Ironwood in this case, he probably sympathizes with Yang a lot, as obviously he has some experience with losing body parts. It's also kind of funny if you think about it with his namesake in The Wizard of Oz. Right when the wizard left, the Tin Man got a heart. All right, so it's a great gift, but Yang turns it down. And we get a series of shots afterwards of Yang duly doing daily tasks with just one arm. My thinking is that she feels she would rather be inconvenienced with only having the one arm than have to accept the fact that she lost the other arm. Putting on that robotic prosthetic would be the final bit of acceptance of what happened. She does not want to do that. In the end of all of her chores, she's cleaning dishes, she drops a glass, shattering it. And it's sound triggering Yang into a panic attack. I think they were trying to make the glass shattering sound kind of like a blade being swung. It's very interesting that that would be the thing that would set Yang off. Not seeing Adam's face on television, though she had a reaction, a very small one, but more to the sharp sound that the glass made. Now, this looks like PTSD to me, but I'm not too well versed in that field, so I'd rather not get too deep into something I know that little about and say something stupid. So during Yang's attack, her father is dutifully watching in the wings, and man, Bernie Dad deserves an award for most patient parent here. He's not 
pushing Yang at all out the door to go search for Ruby, even though she ran off. He's probably not happy Ruby's gone, but has accepted it at the very least. And he is here being shown giving Yang her space, but making sure he is there for if and when she is ready to accept his help. Scene 3, the sea dragon fight. Back on the boat, the sun is setting and Blake is still brooding on her own when she notices the same hooded figure that we saw from the previous scene following her. But before she can investigate, they are all attacked by a giant leviathan-like sea grim, the biggest sea grim that this ship's crew has ever seen. The fight begins with Blake, the ship cannons, and eventually the hooded stranger being revealed as Sun. I gotta say, I really enjoyed some parts of this fight, and disliked several more. Let's start with the sound. The sound design sucked. I'm sorry, but everything just sounded so muted, like they were afraid of turning up the bass because they'd wake up the upstairs neighbors. You have a giant ass flying dragon that roars quieter than a Beowulf. It's smashing through rock pillar formations that you don't even hear sometimes. Uh, and the main cannon of the ship sounds like the regular smaller cannons. All you had to do was add some more bass to the original cannon sound, maybe a bit more of an echo to make it just sound that much of a bigger blast. But nope, it just really kind of felt like that they had stark cannon sound effect number one, and they just slapped it in there without any thought, so every cannon sounds the same. The music, though, was great, as it always is, and... At least the final sound of the Sea Grim actually exploding when it's hit was very satisfying. But going back, the ship pinning the Grim could have had a harder impact, even maybe like a bit of like a wood creaking sound in there too. I actually think that that stuff is there though. Um, I think the main fault of it is might have been the music was too loud to hear those effects underneath it, which... The sound balance is something I've complained about with this show for years already. I wonder if it could be something as simple as the episode was rushed, so they didn't have time to balance the sound out properly. It's just like, oh, great, the music's here. Slam it in. Put the sound effects. Go, go, go. Post it on the website. Or they maybe spent too much time on it. We have a saying where you get 5.1 over the head at the studio that I work at. Um, it's not a real term, but just some of our buddies use it. Um... It is when a sound operator spends so much time making sure that the 5.1 audio will be perfect that they forget about how the simple stereo or mono mix down will sound for people with basic speakers at home. Thus, you get this situation where explosions sound way too loud than they should or music sounds way too loud than it should. Uh, simple conversations are too quiet because when you mix 5.1 down to just two speakers, you're taking like audio, like when people talk, it usually just comes from the center console speaker. And then you have a lot of background sounds and that coming from your satellite speakers behind you. But music almost always comes from all of them, uh, mainly from uh, your two left and right speakers and uh, leaving the speech in the center. But you'll hear a little bit of music mixed in with the background sound in the back speakers sometimes. I'm not an audio expert, but this is just basically how it goes. But if you mix all that down just to two speakers, then the, a lot of times the music will overpower it. And I wonder if maybe this is what's something that's going on. I'm really just guessing. But long story short, the music overpowered a lot of the sound effects. But the sound effects still could have used a bit more oomph to them. My only other complaint is the same as the first episodes. Small people fighting big monsters. It's just hard to choreograph. There were a couple of instances also in this one, where I thought Blake was kind of swinging around like 1960s Spider-Man, where you're kind of questioning what the hell is she swinging from? The good parts, though, I love the new Grim design. From it starting as just a sea serpent to the wings popping out of its back mid-fight, and the hyper beam. That was a good sound effect. It just sounded so perfect, the charging sound it had. Um... Maybe, though, it might just be because it was picked out easier over the music by our ears due to the high-pitched nature of the sound, but I still found it very satisfying to hear. The best parts, the very best parts of the fight, though, even more so than the Grim. The Grim was beautiful, but the character interaction during the fights, 
the captain and his crew at that little extra bit of excitement as he's ordering them, get the cannons ready. Hey, hunters, if you get them on our left port, whatever side, we'll be able to take them out. These people that are so much out of their league, the, the ship's crew, but still trying to help the professional huntsman. That's great. Then you have Blake and Sun. God, the chemistry between those two is great as they're sort of saying quips at each other. Blake drops Sun as she catches him and then the vice versa happens. And that one, like them catching each other and then doing the toss right afterwards. If anyone's seen Final Fantasy Advent Children where they toss each other all the way up during the Bahamut fight, they pretty much emulate that perfectly when they're tossing each other using their clones. And then that little extra bit of like animosity between Sun and Blake as instead of him giving her a boost, she steps on his head. And lastly, what I've been saying over and over again, the facial expressions. The facial expressions during the fight, just so much, especially because Blake is pissed at Sun the whole time and going on to that theme. The facial expressions right before Sun got slapped. I couldn't stop laughing at the end of that scene because it was not just a funny facial expression, but it was a perfect transition. Slap to black. Scene 3.5, the open seas at dusk. This is a bit of time has passed, possibly a few hours, and the sun has now fully set. We are back on the deck of the ship, and Blake is pissed with Sun for following her. Now, had he been following her for the whole eight months, or did he just catch up with her now? Either way, Sun thought Blake had a nor more of a noble reason for leaving after the Battle of Beacon, building Blake up in his mind as being some sort of hero looking for justice, going after the White Fang on her own, where she is actually kind of on the run, heading home to deal with business back in Menagerie. So not entirely running away, but still keeping away from the White Fang for a bit. Just a quick thing I wanted to mention because I didn't say this when I was recording on camera, so I'm going to do this right now. I noticed while editing that Blake's ears also move depending on her mood, how they kind of curl down to show how angry she is, especially in this shot. It's so great. Okay. Back to the original record. Scene four, Salem's Domain. This must be one of the sessions Salem was talking about. There seems to be something alive inside of Cinder. You can hear it sort of growing and like clicking. This session with Salem is teaching Cinder how to use the grim bug that's inside her to maybe regrow her arm or repair the damage that's been done to her arm which I think might possibly make her arm, once it's all fixed up, look more like Salem. Also, the Grim Scarab that she used to steal the Fall Maiden's power, that is now the new reason why I think Cinder is weak to ruby silver eyes, more so than being a maiden. Because technically, if there's a Grim inside of her, she is now part Grim. And we've already heard the explanation that grim or weak to silver eyed powers so maidens being weak to silver eyed powers that's off the table i'm completely not believing that anymore it is now in my head the most plausible theory that cinder is weak to the silver eyed warriors because of the grim that's inside of her their session gets interrupted by a metroid actually i think it's a jellyfish now here's the interesting part of uh, mr jellyfish here just like how cinder talk to the dragon back last volume here we have not just salem talking to this jelly grim but the grim communicating with salem first this leads to salem asking cinder if she actually killed ozpin salem has doubts ladies and gentlemen maybe this grim just reported an ozpin sighting and cinder has all this time just been lying to protect herself if salem has doubts like, she has doubts to the point where she forces Cinder to say it herself instead of speaking through Emerald. And boy, does she get angry when she tries to get Emerald to say it for her. She gets those glowing red eyes, which are a real nice touch when she gets angry. Kind of makes me think if uh, Salem has a sort of uh, ability like Lord Voldemort, where she can tell if people are lying or not. Um possibly maybe she's just a really good judge of character because she's probably been alive forever um it's very interesting to think so 
She instructs the Jelly Grim to go and send more reinforcements to Beacon and to look for a relic. What kind of relic could Salem want? Something that's in Beacon. Perhaps something that Ozpin had. Something Ozpin was protecting. Or maybe he even stole that relic from Salem's group. If you think about my previous theory about him once being a part of Salem's group. If that holds up, that relic could originally have been Salem's. Originally something that she might have used to start this whole thing. Or create herself like she could have been a normal human in this relic okay i'm going too far with that so i wonder where he would have kept this relic there's a possibility that it could have been his cane he used his cane for a lot of fighting it might have been partially the source of his power but that might also be just too obvious so in the end salem says what are you planning and then we cut to black who is she talking about? Ozpin? What is Ozpin planning? Is Ozpin actually alive? Or maybe she's talking about Crow and Glinda. What really is the relic? Will Yang get better anytime soon? And what waits for Blake and Menagerie? All that and more will be waiting for us next episode, which I am very much looking forward to. If they keep on going at this rate of like story development and character development, hopefully my biggest biggest need my my hope for the next fight because as i've said the last couple of fights have been eh, just middling for me just only whelmed i would have to say i want a ground fight i want person versus person or person-sized grim versus person i really feel that those fights in this show flow the best and i'm really looking forward to them hopefully doing something like that soon like hopefully we'll get Tyrion fighting with Ruby's crew soon. Um, even Watts or God, Hazel. Hazel Hazel's just a, such a wild card, but I'm rambling. So that's it for me. Thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed my rambling, please like, subscribe, and even share with your friends. And until next time, good night, everybody.